It's always a good thing to make up for lost time. <laughs> I mean, you do want to get your twenty-something dollars per unit's worth of education. That's that's important. Well, talking about education, that's you know, I'm I'm preloaded the screen with some uh, interesting news that I have um, dug up, you know, recently. So one is. Oh, this is this is an interesting one. You know, some of you may know this one already. Um, there's a web. I, I think this website, Castmark. Does anyone know of Castmark as a program, as a software? No. Okay. Well, apparently, it is some sort of benchmark in a program that can benchmark on CPU performance, uh, hard drive performance, video card performance, and so on and so forth. But they also encourage their users to submit, you know, what they know about the hardware. So if you're in the market for a new hard drive, a video card, or something like that, you know, this is one source of information that you can look up, at least to see you know, where your component sits relative to other components. I mean, you cannot trust it entirely. In other words, you know, if you look up the hard drive stuff, and you look up and say, oh, I want this particular drive, okay, it doesn't matter which one, I would just randomly pick one. So let's say you pick a... So many of these are uh, not hard drive, they are solid, solid state drive. So this one is a real hard drive. I know you cannot see the, the name of the entry, but let's just say that you find that this one you know, seems to have a really good price per do, you know, performance per dollar ratio, then you can do some more additional research you know, just to see whether it really is a good drive or not. But it's a really good chart. I was able to find the hard drive in my you know, six year old you know, server at home yeah, Doctor Tech is actually a six-year-old you know server, and of course the performance of the hard drive is like all the way down. What's and, the best one? Hmm? What's the best one? The best one. These are solid-state drives. I mean, you know, there's no. You can also look at the. But this is not a dollar amount. This is number of megabytes per second transfer. So some of these are just insanely fast. Uh, some of these are not big hard drives. I mean, solid-state drives, you know, can be fairly small. Yeah, but the one that I'm looking at right now is called is the Samsung. Uh, I can't remember. Well, let's see. It's down here somewhere. The performance is not really top notch, but so but neither is the price. A 500 gig hard drive for 50 bucks, and the performance is better than you know some of the hundred 150 dollar drives. So you know, I cannot complain. So that's what I'm getting. Besides, I'm putting together a RAID system, so I don't need a single drive to be really big. I just need the the total capacity to be enough for what I do. So that's one thing you know. I just want I just wanted to show you guys if anyone is looking for um, you know relative or comparison between components. This seems to be a pretty good website. As I said, you know, don't trust it entirely, but at least you know it gives you an idea of where the component that you are thinking of is. You know where it, how it compares to other components. Yep. <clears throat> yeah. Cool stuff, the cool stuff site. Yeah, the cool stuff. Yeah, I suppose you can. I'll just go ahead and do that. It's not really my cool stuff. It's more like my cool finding in this case. So I'll go, just go ahead and add a link to it. Now, obviously, I don't work for that place. I don't get any money from uh, that particular place. So. This is a benchmark stuff. I'll think of a better name later. But I just thought you know it could be useful to many people who want to like replace a component or you know want to buy you know something to make their system perform better. So that's one. And then the, let's see what else do I have here. That goes one. Let's see. The second one is. Oh, you timed me out already. Okay, this one is kind of interesting too because it is more interesting from the perspective of, you know, it is open source and how hardware companies are now supporting open source. How many people run your own or know how to configure your own little residential router that you have at home? Okay. Now, how many, how many of you, you know, thought it would be better if it is all Linux-based so you can do some scripting and do some additional configuration? This is it. 
BD-WRT is an open source project to turn, you know, most, you know, not all, but some of the residential gateway can now be turned into quote unquote a Linux box. It still is, it, you will still have all the functionality that it has before, but now it is running Linux. And this particular distribution of Linux also contains all the necessary software to turn your router into whatever you want to turn it into. Uh, they even preload this, you know, into some routers that are being sold for 50 bucks. A wireless and router for 50 bucks has this software already preloaded. And the same device can be a router, can also be a switch, can also be a um, bridge. You know, it can be a wireless to wired bridge. So it can serve many, many functions because you know, what it does now depends on how you configure on the Linux side. For those of you who, are, who like to write scripts, you know, this gives you all the possibilities of writing your own scripts. So I, I just thought it was kind of cool. It also kind of points out you know, how um, the hardware community, you know, people making routers, are now accepting open source not only as a way of selling the product, but also as a way to make more profit. Can anyone tell me why they might be making more profit because of open source? Yep. It's free to load it up on something and then sell it. Exactly. And, and it sells, and it, it is also free, because if, it is, if it's not Linux, if they use any type of other embedded kernels, they actually have to pay a per copy license per device. Okay? But now they don't have to pay that money, and you know, it sells you know, at least equally as good as you know, the ones that have a like, more customized um, operating system. So I just thought that's also kind of interesting um, in the context of you know, how open source is actually becoming. Well, that doesn't make any sense. So if it's free, how is DDWRT making money? They don't. See, but that's the whole idea. The idea is the software is free, but you need some hardware to put it, put it onto. Um, they're making money off the hardware. It is the yeah exactly. The hardware manufacturers will probably hire someone to help out with the open source free software project so that they can sell the hardware a little bit more easily, and they can also make more money, because now the software is entirely free, they don't have to pay a licensing fee for the software that usually goes onto their routers. They, um, they don't do any type of you know, hardware by themselves, you know, but they do professional stuff too. So if you look up their website, main page, I guess that's the main page. They do have, you know, support. You know, in other words, if you are a manufacturer of, you know, hardware, and you don't want to deal with a software aspect, but you want to make sure that you know, DDWRT can run on your hardware perfectly, you can hire these people to make sure that kernel and you know everything that goes with it will work smoothly with the hardware that you have that you have manufactured or the hardware that you will be manufacturing. In other words, you can still make money, but not from licensing the software, but, the, but from the service that you provide to people who want to use the software. Now, for people who want to just do some experimentation at home and don't really mind if their router goes down, you know, well, they don't have to pay a single dime. They can just load this onto the router and play with it. But it does open up all kinds of possibilities, because what it does is it turns your router into a Linux box. Basically, that's what it does. So it depends on what you want to specify to be on that distribution, and that is entirely up to you. So they can have you know all kinds of you know firewall software, all kinds of uh, routing you know mechanisms you know built into the same router that you think is just a residential gateway, but now it can be actually a fairly sophisticated network device. Any questions about this one? Comments? I can give you guys more feedback later because I just ordered one. <laughs> For 50 bucks, I mean, you know, a wireless and router. You know, I'm still, you know, using wireless G at home, so I'm really on the slow side of things. All right, so that's another one. And then there's a third one. The third one is actually even more interesting. It is this one here. And I don't know why it keeps timing me out. Okay. So this one is definitely related to this class. 
I'm just bumping up the font size a few times. Okay, so here we have um, this person is a um, professor at the University of Illinois. I think it's uh, one of the main campuses of uh, UC. I mean U. I in this case. And the conclusion, if I just skip all the way to the end, da, da, da. the whole point of the article is math is not important to most people. And I'm waiting for it to scroll. <laughs> okay, so there we have it down here. Okay, those who do love math and science have been doing very well. Our graduate schools are the best in the world. This nation at risk has, you know, it's basically referring to a paper that was published in the 80s saying that the United States is a nation at risk because, you know, people are not understanding or they're not taking math seriously. Has, pro has produced about 140 Nobel laureates since uh, 1983. Well, the question is how many of those are, you know, your first or second generation, you know, from another country, and how many of those, you know, are, quote unquote, more native. As for the rest, there's no obligation to love math any more than grammar, composition, curfew, or washing up after dinner. Why create a need to make it palatable to all and spend taxpayers' money on pointless endeavors without demonstrable results or accountability? Blah, 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 blah. So basically the whole point is, you know, we don't need to know that much math. The average person does not need to know that much math. Now, I would disagree, okay? And I can show you guys why I disagree. I would just go back to what I wrote about this. You know, just, and it kept timing up. So that, this is you know, what I wrote to the department. So let's not even talk about the in the context of a programmer, because obviously programmers need to know more about math than other people. Um, math is needed to calculate the break-even point of owning a more expensive but efficient vehicle. In other words, you think about getting, let's say somebody is in the market for a new car. You can get a Corolla for, what, $15,000-ish these days. You can also get a Prius for quite a bit more. Now, the Prius is definitely a lot more fuel efficient compared to a Corolla. But the question is, how much, you know, how much time does it take, or how many miles does it take for the Corolla to waste you know, money on gas to the point that it will break even? That's the question, okay? And it's a question that you can only answer if you understand enough about math and do some projections you know, and say, okay, if I drive this many miles a year, assuming the price of gas is this much and so on and so forth, you know, the break-even point will be in like six years. But since the car can, is probably be good for say 20 years or 15 or 10, you know, so in the end you will still be you know, on the plus side if you buy a more fuel efficient car. On the other hand, if you only drive you know, two or three miles a day, it will take a much longer time you know, to break even because you won't be using any gas you know, even if your car is, you know, fuel, is, is not fuel efficient. Okay, so it is also needed to understand surveys, polls, and studies. Now, this is a, a very good context of this stuff here, is um, if you guys drive past, you know, the, those intersections, you know, from Eastern or around this neighborhood, you probably have seen, you know, yes on D and no yes. on D. Yes? Okay, do you guys don't know what is yes on D and no on D? Yeah, you know, whether the, whether the art and, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say it has to do with uh, <clears throat> making uh, this area its own city. I'm not sure whether and ARC is actually a part of that. The taxes. I'm not sure whether ARC is actually a part of the uh, proposed city food. I think ARC is already out of the proposed city food. I think it is too. I think it Edison is. Edison may be the top, maybe the northernmost part of the uh, city food. But the question is, you know, will the area generate enough revenue to sustain, you know, its own police force, its own fire department, it, its own waste management, and so on and so 